Thank you for that <clears throat> song. We're going to be in 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4 this morning. First Peter 4, we began last week looking at verses 10 and 11 as a unit together. And so we saw la part 1 last week, which was verse 10, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And if you'll remember, we saw the reception of God's gift, As every man hath received the gift. Second, the reciprocation, even so minister the same one to another and then the responsibility as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We are the stewards of the manifold grace of God. And we saw last time how God is giving us this instruction as, to us as church members to use our spiritual gifts in his church. But the context of this is during a time of persecution. It's difficult enough for us to live spiritually when things are easy. It's difficult enough for us to impart and use, employ a spiritual gift in our lives for the benefit of others when things are easy for us. But it is especially difficult, and it's especially needed when things, uh, excuse me, when things are easy, but it's especially needed and difficult when things are hard and heavy. And when there's persecution or suffering of some kind coming about. And when there's a difficult time you're progressing through. And so this was the instruction of the Lord regarding the spiritual gift. But verse 11, he says, if any man speak... Let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so we see four different points from this verse this morning. <clears throat> as he says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. So you have these words, speak and minister. And those are the ministries, the ministries of spiritual gifts that God would have for us to apply in his church, but also the manner of our employment of these gifts in God's church. Because he says, if any man speak, let him speak as of the oracles of God. Then also the means, those who are ministering, he says, let them do it according to the strength that God gives, according to the ability which God giveth. And then lastly, and most importantly, the motivation that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. If you would stand with me for the reading of God's word this morning, we'll read again from verse 1 all the way down through verse 11, and then we'll cease. Let's read together. The first word is for as much. Here we go. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live to the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. If 
Father, we come to your word now. We pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us. I pray for those who may be here who have not yet trusted in Christ and therefore do not have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling them and therefore are, do not have a spiritual gift. I pray that you'd help them this morning to understand their need of a Savior and their need of being born again. I pray for each one of your people here who has trusted in Christ and has been born again and have now the Spirit of God and have the spiritual gift uh, imparted into their lives. I pray that you would help each one of us to understand what your will is for us and how it is that you expect us to accomplish your will together in Christ's body on this earth. Thank you for your word again, Lord, and we pray that you use it in our hearts. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Appreciate you standing for that. <clears throat> Verse 11, he says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And if any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. And so I first want you to see the ministries of God, the ministries of God, because he details two sections, two categories of ministries that God has for his people, and they involve our physical bodies. As Romans chapter 12 says, I beseech you there, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. God works in Christ's body through the physical bodies, the members of his church who are part of Christ's body. That's how God desires to work in this world. God desires to work through his churches. God desires to work through his saints who have the spiritual gifts. And God's spiritual gifts in our lives are for the primary focus of edification of Christ's body as we are together, but also secondarily as we go out into the world we as God's saints who have the Spirit of God are to be using our spiritual gift to serve him even in the culture and in our homes, but especially in Christ's body. But he details these two categories of things that we can use our physical bodies for. So when it comes to motion and when it comes to having an effect on this world, what are the two things that your physical body can do? Well, you can do one thing, and that is you can move. All right? You can move. Generally speaking, if you're a living human being, you can move. There are some people in the hospital or have been paralyzed who don't have the physical ability to move, but we're talking generalities here. You have the physical ability to move about and to accomplish something with your hands and with your feet. God has given you the ability to move about. And because you have the Spirit of God in you, He wants you to use your physical body as you move about to serve Him. That's why He says, secondly in the verse, verse 11, if any man minister... Let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. We use our hands and our feet, our physical bodies, to minister to one another. We do it all the time. We do it without even realizing it. And that's probably the best way to do it. We do it. Wives, you do it. Mothers, you do it when you prepare meals for your family. Fathers, you do it when you go to work every, every uh, Monday or whatever day you go to work. This is an opportunity for ministry. You're using your physical body to accomplish something. But not just your physical body. Also, he says at the beginning of the verse, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Not only do we have the ability physically to move about, but we have the ability to speak and make audible sounds. And our sounds can be used for good or they can be used for evil. We can use our words and our tongues to encourage, to edify, to challenge, or we can use our words to demean we can use our words to manipulate. We can use our words to stir up strife. We can use our words to gossip. We can use our words for good, or we can use our words for bad. If any man speak, let him speak as of the oracles of God. And these are the two categories that God places us into as we come to minister to the Lord. Now, these are not categories that pigeonhole us, as we'll see in a moment, but they are categories of strength categories of strength where God has enabled us more in one area than another. Some of you, if you were asked to come and do what I'm doing right now, speak from the pulpit, you would uh, physically tremble and you may flee. You may just run away. And that's okay. Some of you, if you're asked to go dig a ditch, would say, there's no way I can possibly ever do that. But there are times when even those who don't like to speak publicly have to give a word of challenge, whether it's publicly or privately, and they have to speak with their tongue. There are times when those who primarily focus on speaking need to be focused on ministering with their hands and with their feet. And so we should not pigeonhole ourselves or anybody else into one or other of these categories, though the Lord, 
identifies strengths in our lives that he has given to us by the Spirit of God, and he places us into one of these two categories, either speaking gifts or ministry gifts. Okay, so we could say speaking or service, if you want to keep two S's so that you can remember it, (laughs) speaking gifts or service gifts. And God has given you, if you're a child of God, if you've been born again, then God, through the Spirit of God, has given you a gift that falls into one of these two categories. Now, what are the speaking gifts and what are the service gifts? Well, I'd like you to hold your place there in 1 Peter as we talk about these ministries, as he says, if any man speak and if any man minister, and go over to Romans chapter 12, because Romans chapter 12 is the one place in Scripture, the one place in Scripture where the spiritual gifts are enumerated for us. And you'll hear different theologians speak of several different passages where they believe the spiritual gifts are mentioned, but there, there are different Greek words behind the English words there, and so we should not conflate the two. This is the only passage where all of the spiritual gifts are enumerated for us. There are seven, seven spiritual gifts, and we should identify them, and we should be able to discern which spiritual gift it is that God has given to us so that we can use that gift because that's a natural, not natural in the flesh, but natural in the spirit, strength of ours to accomplish for him. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. As we quoted already, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So we're going to use our bodies, our physical bodies and our tongues for God's service. We are not our own. We are bought with a price, the Lord tells us. Be not conformed to this world, but but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means that our, our mindset, our ideology needs to be a Christ-like ideology instead of a worldly or a secular ideology. Our morality and our standard of morality needs to be biblical and scriptural and not based on what things we enjoy or what the culture tells us. Our service for the Lord and our strengths should not be focused on just what we can accomplish in this world, as that what, that's what the world uses different aptitudes for. Well, you are good at this thing, then you should do this for the benefit of the culture, or for the accumulation of wealth to yourself, or for the impact to your family, whatever it might be, use your strength to that effect. Whereas when God gives us spiritual enablement, he desires us to use our spiritual gift according to his will. As he says here, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove, so that you can understand and discern... What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? God has a perfect will for you and for me when it comes to service in his church. And he wants us to use the spiritual gifts that he has given to each one of us to enable us to accomplish his will. Look at verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me, Paul is talking about there about his own gift and about the own charge of the Lord to him, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. And this is what a trap that we fall into, don't we? We think, well, I have this skill, I have this aptitude, and therefore I am the authority on this matter. We fall into that trap in the culture. Well, these are the experts, and we listen to them about everything blindly. But often we feel that we are, the own, are our own expert in whatever field it is. And maybe in the spiritual gift that God has given us, we become puffed up and prideful, thinking that, my gift is better than somebody else's, or thinking that I accomplish my gift better than somebody else accomplishes theirs, or thinking that because I have this gift, therefore I am the voice that should instruct and lead everybody else in this matter. But these things are not the case. Those are man-focused ideologies. Look what God says. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think soberly, which is to think accurately, and to be in your right mind, and to be controlled in your thinking, because our thoughts run amok. Our thoughts go beyond where they should, and constantly we have to be restraining and reining in our thoughts and bringing them back, renewing them according to the word of God, back into order and say, wait a second, no, this is not about me. This is not about me. This is about the Lord's work. Think soberly. According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith, and we'll mention that verse later on, God has given you your spiritual gift. God has given you the ability, along with your spiritual gift, to accomplish whatever it is. God has given you the platform of whatever kind it is, 
and he might take it away. Maybe because you're doing wrong with it, or maybe because he wants you to do something else. Or maybe because he wants to see how you'll respond if he takes away your platform. The Lord does all of these things to us, and he says, For as we have mem many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, not everybody has the same job, not everybody has the same ministry, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. If you're a member of Bible Baptist Church, then we are connected. That's why a schism or a tear or a departure from the body is so painful and so destructive to God's assembly, because we are one body together. And so when one leaves or is separated, it hurts. And if it's leaving because of a disease, because of a bad thing rather than a donation, then it hurts the worse. Uh, if you have to lose a kidney because you have a disease, that's a bad thing. If you lose a kidney because you're donating it to somebody else, then that's not as bad of a thing, is it? That's not as destructive as a thing. It still hurts. Oh, it still hurts. But it's a, a productive thing, and it's a fruitful thing. So sometimes we have that, but a schism, a tear that is not God-ordained hurts. And it's a, it's a, the root cause of that is a disease iniquity in the spiritual sense, sinfulness. We being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, and now he's going to detail the gifts. Grace, by the way, the word, Greek word charis, often is the, is the word for gifts. Now there is another word for gift in the New Testament. Actually, there's a couple, but one of them, one of the other more more used one is doron, which is, means a gift that you give to somebody. But this word is grace gift, and it's a gift of just generosity. It's a gift of God's generosity to us. So our spiritual gift is a gift of God's generosity to us. It has nothing to do with how great we are. It has nothing to do with how hard we work. It has nothing to do with our level of sincerity. It's God's generous gift to us. And so whatever God gives to us and whatever place he gives us to minister it, let us do it in sincerity and to the best of our ability. But always remember, it's God's generosity, God's generous gift to us, for which we are, as we celebrated this week, thankful. But here are the gifts, the seven gifts, beginning in the second part of verse 6, prophecy is the first one. He says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. So there's gift one. This is a speaking gift. Prophecy. It is the idea of not telling something that is going to happen in the future that nobody knows and revealing some unknown thing in this age. It did, in, it did at some times, but even those prophets of the Old Testament, most of their ministry was not telling that which was unseen that was going to happen in the future. Most of their ministry was telling people right and wrong. Samuel, most of his ministry was telling people, don't do that, do this. He told the people, he said, uh, God forbid that I should sin in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. His focus was teaching them the good and the right way. And then occasionally God revealed some hidden truth to him to tell to the people that was something that would come in the future. That's what prophecy is today. We don't have those who can tell the future. Uh, the sign gifts that God had promised have ceased. He promised them for the inauguration and authorization of the gospel message and of his church. But now... As 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, those things would pass away. Those supernatural sign gifts would pass away. We still have supernatural gifts, though, and here they are. Prophecy, which is the idea of foretelling or uh, giving spiritual truth, preaching the word of God, prophecy. The second there is ministry in verse 7. Ministry or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, okay? Ministry is the Greek word diakonos, and it has the idea of serving one another. Now, is that a speaking gift or a service gift? Well, it's going to be a service gift. Does that mean the person who has the gift of ministry never has a good word for somebody? Never has a word of challenge? Never has a word of instruction? No, it's a ministry gift. It's a service gift, okay? And so they focus on that, but they can do the other as well, okay? Somebody who has the gift of ministry is going to, remember our passage, our text passage, we have those who speak, speak as the oracles of God, those who ministry, minister according to the ability which God giveth. So we have these two categories, which is what we're doing, as well as identifying the gifts. We have ministry. Now we have teaching, verse 7. He that teacheth on teaching. 
Okay, this is the person who likes to identify the details of God's word and expose those for other people. Likes to identify the patterns and the correlations of different things in scripture and present them to God's people. We have some teachers in our own body. We have some teachers that we enjoy having come in. We enjoy having Dr. Strauss come in because he is a great teacher. And he has, is able to identify different things in scripture, patterns and chronologies and timelines and all of these things, connections between passages and lay them out for us for our edification. Uh, that's what a teaching spirit does. Then we have exhortation, verse 8, he that exhorteth on exhortation. The word of exhortation, the person who gives the exhortation is the person who can give a challenge, usually on, a, on an encouraging level. In other words, let's do this together, or you can do this. It's an encouragement. Providing courage to somebody else is the idea of the word encouragement, and that's the idea of the word exhortation. It can be a word of challenge or even a word of warning, but usually with the idea of let's go forward. Wind in the sails is how I view in my mind's eye the spiritual gift of exhortation. My pastor, Pastor Smith, who was just here, is a great encourager. And the church down there uh, in a, a Community Baptist has taken on the personality of their pastor, generally speaking, of being an encouraging church. That's what their main ministry is, is an, a ministry of encouragement. They do many of the other things. It's a good teaching church, and they show mercy and all these other things. But they are great encouragers. Pastor Smith is a great encourager. I'm so thankful for that. Uh, in my own life, he encouraged me. He that exhort, exhorteth on exhortation. Some of you have the gift of exhortation, and you just have a knack for uh, finding those whose hands are hanging down and picking them up. And you have a knack for just, maybe you give a word of praise. Hey, you did such a wonderful job on that. Some of you do it to me. You'll say, hey, that message was such a, exactly what I needed. What a great blessing. And I'm like, yeah, okay. You, I, it wasn't for you. You know, it was for, it was for this person over here. You know, and I, I know who you are, who need it. No, uh, but you have a word of encouragement. That encourages me. Does that mean someone who has the gift of teaching can't be an encouragement? No. But that means some people just naturally fall into that on a spiritual level. They're encouragers. Praise God for the encouragers. I need you. Let me tell you that. And we all need you. We need the encouragers. Just like we need the teacher. And just like we need the uh, prophet. Just like we need those who are ministers. Look at verse uh, 8 again. He that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth. Let him do it with simplicity. <clears throat> he that giveth. You know giving is a spiritual gift as well. Giving. I say uh, God often enables the givers to give. So he often gives them finances in order to be givers. Sometimes givers don't have a lot of finances. But givers are those who, whether anybody knows about it or not, they see a need and they want to provide for that need. And God has given them the ability in themselves, and it is such a spiritual ability to just be like, you know what, give. Yeah, you know how most people are? I want to hold on to this. I want to control this bank account as long as I possibly can to my last breath. I don't want somebody else having it. I want to hold on to it. And then every once in a while, you meet one of these people who's got God has given the spiritual gift of giving to, and they just live life with open hands. Praise God for that. By the way, there's a spiritual principle for all of us in that if we live life with open hands, often the Lord gives us more. So often the Lord provides for givers because they keep on giving. So the Lord's uh, logic is, if you're going to keep giving it in obedience to me, then I'll keep supplying it so that you can give it. And that's a supernatural enablement from the Lord, the spiritual gift of giving. Praise God for that. He that ruleth with diligence. Ru the, the gift of ruling is the gift uh, uh, mostly of being organized. They can provide structure to a situation. Here's the scope and sequence in a class setting, in an education setting of how this should go. Uh, you should be able to cover this amount of material and this amount of time, and this amount of material needs to be understood before this material and eventually we'll get to the point where the goal is completed. Or what about in a church setting? Well, we need to organize this over here. This needs to be structured. We need a schedule over here. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be chaos. I'll tell you what, if I was the only one who did scheduling in our church, it would be chaos. I'm not the most organized person you ever met. I have a responsibility to be somewhat organized, especially as the pastor of the church. So I am somewhat organized, okay? And that's a challenge for me. <laughs> Some of you are just so organized. And you love organization. Uh, brother uh, 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 Tim, he, he's got the spiritual gift of ruling. And I know a couple of you do too, but I just mentioned Tim because he looks at my desktop on my computer and I have these uh, program icons everywhere and files. They're all just all over. I know where they are. 
But uh, he says, I could never operate that way. He, I got to have these things and it, it's got to be orderly. You know, you're a mess is what he would say to me if he really wanted to, you know. Uh, this is the way it, it, struc it structures. And so they can organize things how they're going to be accomplished. It, it's a necessary thing for God's church, isn't it? Does that mean the person who's organized can't be flexible? No. No, we have to be flexible with one another. We have to have, be merciful to one another, which is the next spiritual gift. Or we have to be willing to, uh, though things aren't going to plan, give it a word of encouragement. Or we need to realize that sometimes a challenge is necessary, even if it gets outside of our scope and sequence order. These, life, life is uh, different than we would like it to schedule out and plan out. You know, you got your calendar and you got your uh, day planner like they used to have, you know. We should get back to that. That was a better way to do it. <clears throat> Got all, I've got a calendar on my phone. I've got a calendar on my computer. I've got a printed calendar. Oh, it's a mess. And uh, uh, then I've got to sync a calendar with somebody else, and it doesn't work right or it didn't sync. Uh, what a mess. Uh, but but uh, this is the spiritual gift of ruling. Okay, how about, uh, he, lastly, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. We need these merciful people because the merciful people are the people who care about the lack of, or about the wounds of others. And they come and they pour, pour in oil and wine and they bandage up the wound and they make someone understand that their need and their wound is someone has concern for them. Someone comforts them. The Lord Jesus manifested this as well as he did all the spiritual gifts and he showed compassion and he showed pity and he showed mercy. And this is what God desires for each one of us, is to show mercy. The, often the people who have the gift of mercy are very loving people. Not that the other people can't be loving either. But they're very loving people. Because they have a, an aptitude, a spiritual aptitude, and a spiritual bent to show mercy to one another. You know what? We need all of these gifts. And when we use them, we often uh, employ them at people. Which is not a bad thing. But we should be careful not to do that too much. But those who have the spiritual gift of uh, ruling, they think, well, here's maybe how it could be done better. The people who have the spiritual gift of teaching says, I, I want you to know it so that you understand it. The person who has the spiritual gift of exhortation says, I want you to be encouraged by it. I want it to be a blessing to you. The person who has the spiritual gift of mercy wants you to be comforted by it. The person who has the spiritual gift of giving wants you to be provided for in it person who has the spiritual gift of prophecy just wants you to do it <laughs> would you just do it would you just be obedient these are the things that god has enabled us to minister in to one another and god has given you i believe at least one and i'll say at least because i'm not uh i'm not the lord on these things but we'll say one because of the way the passage is back here in first peter as he says as every man hath received the gift okay so it seems singular there a chief gift or a main gift. So there is an aptitude in your spiritual life at which you are better at than you are the other things in your life. That doesn't mean that you get an excuse now to not practice the other spiritual gifts in your life. It just means that this one is easier for you and you have a more than average skill at it and so you should focus on using that. Uh, we don't take our aptitudes when it comes to our physical lives and say, I'm not going to use my aptitude. In fact, I'm going to do everything but use my aptitude, or I'm going to focus on my aptitude as much as other things. Now, this is why people get involved in hobbies, because they have an aptitude for something, it's something they enjoy doing, something they're naturally good at, and so they focus on those things. They, do, they tend to do those things more than other things. Uh, we have different physical aptitudes, too. You know, uh, uh, I went to, uh, I didn't run it, but I went to see uh, Olivia and uh, Karen and, and uh, Kevin and Curtis and Caleb all run. They all r ran uh, on uh, Thanksgiving morning. They ran the a 5K. And uh, they have an aptitude for running. They have an enjoyment for running. I will say, I'm not as fast as some of them. Curtis is like uh, the road runner compared to me. Caleb is too. Caleb is actually faster than Curtis. Where's Curtis? Are they, are they back there? Yeah, that's embarrassing, Curtis. Your younger brother being, I know what that's like. Uh, they're so fast. They completed it in an amazing amount of time compared to me. It would take me over a half hour. They did it in under 23 minutes. Uh, that, to me, that's shocking. Well, they have an aptitude at it. So 
uh, they do that type of thing and they might enjoy it more than somebody who's not that fast or somebody who doesn't uh, enjoy running as much. So that's just on a physical level, but what about on a spiritual level? It's the same way. Now, is it still good for me to run even though I'm not that fast? Let us all answer the question. Yes. It's still good for me to do it, but it's not my aptitude, okay? So this is the same way it is when we come to spiritual gifts in God's church. And you can see how these things kind of fall into those two categories that he's got listed for us in 1 Peter 4. Speaking gifts and ministry gifts, service gifts, speaking and service. And these gifts fall more or less into those two categories. Some of them are a synthesis, uh, more of a synthesis of the two on a spectrum, but they fall into these two categories. And so as we come back to 1 Peter, we recognize the Two categories that God has given, if any man speak and if any man minister. I want you to notice one more thing before we move on. As, as Paul finished to the Romans this teaching on spiritual gifts, verse 9, right after he finishes the spiritual gifts, what is the word that he uses? He says, let love be without dissimulation or hypocrisy. Let love be. His focus on the spiritual gifts is love. When we come to 1 Corinthians 12, which is where another body passage is mentioned, and a church body passage is mentioned, and where spiritual gifts come into view, the first, uh, at the end of 1 Corinthians, chapter thir- uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, excuse me, he begins 1 Corinthians 13, ending chapter 12 with this, he says, but yet I show unto you a more excellent way, and he de-emphasizes the gifts. He de-emphasizes the individual gifts, the specific gifts. Not that you should de-emphasize the gift that God has given into your life, but you should de-emphasize you in the gift. He says, covet earnestly the best gifts, and I show, yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And what does he say? First Corinthians, first, Corinthians, first Corinthians 13 is what we call the love chapter. Charity. And he's, that's the more excellent way. So both in Romans and in First Corinthians, he says the excellent way, focus on the love of God and love of the brethren in ministering in the church. Don't focus just on your gift. Use your strength for the Lord, but focus on all of it. This is what God's will for us. Okay, so don't overemphasize specific gifts. By the way, this is the problem that Paul dealt with in the church at Corinth. It was people who were glorifying certain spiritual gifts over others. They were saying, I have this spiritual gift, and this is the best one. Or, I am the best at practicing this spiritual gift. Or, so-and-so is the best. Let's all follow, flock over here to follow them. This was the problem at, church, at Corinth, and so what did it cause? Division in the church and discord in the church, not fruitfulness and peace, not edification and being built up, which is what God's purpose is for the gifts. The church at Corinth was in disarray, and so it had to be brought back into order, and that's why he said, the more excellent way is the loving way. This was the problem at Corinth. So we should not pigeonhole people into, assumed identi- into an assumed identity. Well, they're going to respond this way because they have the gift of whatever it is. So uh, the person who has the gift of teaching, he, they're just going to try to explain this to me. Or they're explaining to this to me because they have the gift of teaching. We should not pigeonhole people that way. It occurs sometimes but not every time does someone, so, someone show mercy to you because they have the spiritual gift of mercy. And not every time does someone who have the spiritual gift of mercy, must they show mercy in that situation, okay? So we should be careful about pigeonholing people into these things because this is not what God did. God said you should wait on this gift, but he didn't say recognize that this is what they're going to do and assume that this is how they're going to respond. Do not assume that a person must be a certain way because of their main gift. Or that they must or will respond a certain way because of their main gift. This is an erroneous practice, and it's exactly what they were doing at Corinth. We shouldn't focus that way. Remember from verse 10 of 1 Peter chapter 4, as we look at it, he says, As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The grace of God is manifold, or like a many-colored tapestry. And so we should not have just one color in our lives. Does that make sense? How ma- would I look good if I wore a gray suit with a gray shirt and a gray tie, all the same color. Well, some people might do that, okay? So if you did that today, I'm looking out uh, so I can make fun of you. Don't do that. Have some variety. Variety is the spice of life, they say, you know, right? No, we vary in color, but we coordinate. And that's the way these gifts are. But they should also coordinate in our own lives. 
we should not just have, we should not be one colored, I'm talking about individually. We should not be one colored, we should be multicolored, like a many faceted diamond in our service for Christ. The gift is manifold or multicolored. And Jesus was the only one who perfectly manifested all of the spiritual gifts. But you know, he practiced them all at different times and he filtered them all through all the other six. We may each have one chief or main spiritual gift, one that is more spiritually natural to us, but we must all be practicing all the gifts and allow each one to be filtered through and affected by the other six in our lives. So I have the gift of prophecy. I need to be merciful also. That doesn't mean I always show mercy, but it means that I need to sometimes give people some space. It means I need to show compassion to some people. As a pastor, the Bible says that the pastor is to be apt to teach, so I also have to be able to teach. And in fact, I'm doing that right now. Teaching, able to teach. Uh, I should be able to be an encouragement to you. Would you like it if I never told you that you're doing right, or, or I said you're gonna make it through it, or that I said you can do it in the strength of the Lord, or encouraged you that way? Would, would you think that that would be very nice if I just came up and yelled at you every service? No, so I can't just be the prophet. I've gotta be other things too, and so do you. We have to minister the many-faceted, the multicolored gift of God to one another, as he says. Nobody is not to do the other things in our lives. So do not close off yourself into one area of ministry. Whatever you find yourself doing at the moment, focus on the more excellent way. And your spiritual gift will pierce through that and will come through that. So am I picking up chairs as a way of ministry? Yes. So do that in the more excellent way. At another time, if, I, if the Lord has produced in front of me an opportunity to exercise my gift of teaching or prophecy or, or mercy, whatever it is, then I do that in the more excellent way and that will come forth. Do you understand? So focus on the more excellent way and then use, lean on your aptitude that God has given you, okay? This is, these are the ministries. He says, if any man speak... If any man minister, we may find ourselves serving the Lord in speech or service at any time, and any one of us might. I'm preaching today. On, on uh, This week, I cleaned some bathrooms. I need to do it in the more excellent way. All right? The ministries that God has for us. Okay, not only the ministries, but the manner. The manner. I'm, I'm going to run out of time here because I spent too long on that. I'm sorry. All right, the manner. Notice what he says. If any man speak... Or if any man minister, both of these two identifiers apply to speech and ministry, okay? Speech and service. He says, let him speak as the oracles of God, as the messenger of God. The oracles of God are those, were those revelations of God to people. They were usually brief utterances, which is maybe a, uh, a hint to us. Don't talk too much, you know? But as the oracles of God, we are to be the mouthpiece if we're speaking or the messenger if we're ministering of God. Whether you're speaking or serving, you are standing in the place of the Lord. Remember, this is Christ's body. Christ is not here physically. But through the Spirit of God, he is in each one of us. So he is ministering through us. Or he is speaking through us. That doesn't mean my speech is inspired like the Word of God, but it does mean that I am an emissary of the Lord. Each one of us, are em those of us who have been born again, are emissaries of the Lord God to one another. So whether we're speaking or serving, we're standing in the place of the Lord. So imagine if you have a speaking gift, but you're not being very spirit-filled with ministering or spiritual gift. How does your prophecy come across? Come across as hard? Sometimes it will come across hard anyway, but... Sometimes it comes across hard needlessly because you're not being controlled by the Spirit of God. What about ruling? You might just come across as bossy and inflexible if you're not controlled by the Spirit of God. What about teaching? You might come across as haughty and focused on needless things if you're not controlled by the Spirit of God. Now, you might come across that way anyway, that sometimes non-spiritual filled people receive things wrong. But oftentimes it's the problem with the servant. Oftentimes it is the problem with the minister. But it's so important that as we are speaking, we are recognizing that my, my tongue should be, my mouth should be speaking that which is 
God's will. Not that which is for me. Not that which is just to benefit me. Sometimes it might benefit me, but that can't be my purpose. Have you ever played that game, uh, Whisper Down the Lane? Whisper Down the Lane? Okay, so you whisper something, a, a, a short narrative in the first person's ear, and then they whisper it into the next person's ear, and it goes all the way down until you get to the back of the room, and you ask the pe two people to come from the opposite sides, and you find out what story they told. It's never the same. Why is it never the same? Because when you're just passing something down, you're careless in how you do it. It might be a somber thing, but because it's a game, you're laughing. And so the person doesn't take it seriously. By the end, it's a big joke, when it's really not a big joke. Or you might leave off just one phrase of the information because you're trying to whisper it quickly to the person. By the time the whole story has, gets to the end, the whole story has changed because the context is gone or because there was no, you gave no context to begin with. And this is a, the things, these are the things that we need to be careful about in our speech to one another. What was my purpose in doing that? Was I careless in doing that? Did I ask the Lord to keep the door of my lips before I spoke? As the mouthpiece of God, we must be sure that we are giving God's intended message by our ministry, not a message of how great I am, or not just a will to get the job accomplished, but we must be doing it as the messengers of God. Mark chapter 9, verse 41, Even those who minister, God said, For whoever shall, whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. And these are those who administer to God's servants. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 14 tells us that the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So, I have control over my spirit. You have control over your spiritual gift. You have control over how you minister. And you have control over when you minister. Do you know there are some times where it is not appropriate to practice your spiritual gift? Or any of the spiritual gifts, even if it's not your spiritual gift? Sometimes it's not appropriate to use a speaking gift. Sometimes it's appropriate just to put your head down and work. Sometimes it's appropriate not just to work and ignore everything, but to say something whether it's a word of comfort, or a word of encouragement, or a word of challenge, or a word of instruction. So the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. God's spirit within you is subject to you. How are you going to use it? Are you going to be yielded to the spirit of God so that you can use his spiritual gift for his glory? All right, just because you have something good to say that you think is good, or that I think is good, or a good spiritual gift, even something like mercy. Mercy always seems good, doesn't it? Mercy is not always appropriate. doesn't mean you ought to exercise it at that time. Maybe you shouldn't give to that person. Maybe they're, using, they're not using the money correctly. Maybe you shouldn't give to that person who's going to use it for drugs. Maybe you shouldn't give to that parachurch organization. I shouldn't say maybe. If you're going to give, give to God's church, by the way. God's church is the one who's going to use the money appropriately. I'm not saying you should never give to another cause, but you should, you should prioritize God's church in giving. Just because you have a good spiritual gift or a good thing to say or do doesn't mean you ought to exercise it at that time. Someone might need more exhortation and less teaching. Someone else might need more teaching and less exhortation. Sometimes, this was a great benefit of uh, when I was with uh, Pastor Smith down there and with Community Baptist, my, I, I was with two, two men, Pastor David and Pastor Smith, his father, both of them had the spiritual gift of encouragement. So they'd come and they'd want to come alongside somebody and really encourage them, but I was there and I have the spiritual gift of prophecy, and I was there, and I would sometimes bluntly say, stop doing that. You're doing wrong. Do it this way. Do it Do right. Obey. And we were the one-two punch there sometimes. It was a great thing. Now I have to try to be both. It's a hard thing. I have to, I'm always trying to channel my inner Pastor Smith that I don't have, you know, I'm praying the Lord to help, help me there. So this is how we ought to recognize. Sometimes we don't need this. Sometimes we need this filtered by something else over here. Sometimes the word of prophecy that I need to give could be gentilized. That's not a word, tenderized, instead of harsh. Sometimes it just needs to be harsh. So we have to 
factor these things in. Someone else might need more teaching and less exhortation. Maybe they don't understand. So you can, you can tell them it's going to be great all you want, but they don't understand. So you see how this uh, goes together, how these complement each other. It might be time for you to focus more on the planning and organization or ruling of something and let someone else put the details into practice, the service of it, the ministry of it. Or it might be more time for you to be more involved in ministry and helping and somebody else is already taking care of the structure of it or the ruling of it. Somebody else might need more mercy and somebody else might need less challenge. Somebody might need more challenge and less mercy. The question for us to ask is, what does God want from me at this time? Lord, what do you want me from me for this person at this time? Instead of just carelessly serving or giving or carelessly speaking, let us recognize I am as the oracle of God. The manner of what I'm doing needs to be as the oracles of God. Whether I'm speaking or whether I'm serving, am I doing it as of the oracles of God? What does God want from me? I intended to get through the next two points today, but we're going to save them for next, next week. The means of ministering and the motivation for ministering. We'll look at those next week. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how you use it in our hearts. I thank you for the things that you have taught me in my own life regarding these things. And I pray you teach it to your body this morning. Help us to understand these things and to put them into practice and then to have the joy of them and see how much better we work together as a church body and individually in our own hearts and our own spirits as we are yielded to the spirit of God and as we see the spiritual fruit being born and brought forth in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to look into your holy and precious word again this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.